Hello, my name is Joe Chadwick, and I am doing a presentation on, and slideshow on Herschel Walker, primarily from his book, Breaking Free, My Life with Disassociative Identity Disorder. And here is a reference for the book. His roots, uh, Herschel was born into a very strong nuclear family. He had a strong bond with his parents. He had three brothers, three sisters, st uh, very strong ties to grandparents and extended family. Um, both sides of his family were very, very large. Uh, born in rural Georgia and 50 miles east of Macon, Georgia. It was a poorer family, close-knit family, uh, a very church-going, fun-loving family, and supportive and nurturing. He is currently 52 years old, African-American male, divorced from his ex-wife, Cindy. He does have a son named Christian, and he lives in Dallas, Texas. He is a retired athlete, uh, played football, and he played track and a lot of uh, track events in uh, college, and he was with the U.S. Olympic team for the bobsled, uh, college graduate of the University of Georgia, and he was a criminal justice major, business owner in upper economic class, and he is Christian with a deep devotion to God and very respectful of God, and God plays a huge part in his life throughout this. Uh, the next 16 slides or so are multi-dimensional biosocial assessment. Um, Herschel was born on March 3rd, 1962. He is 52 years old, divorced, African-American male. He lives in an upscale suburban neighborhood in Dallas, uh, divorced from wife Cindy, and he states that he loves his son, but he rarely mentions him throughout the book. His son's name is Christian. He is a college graduate and a successful business owner. Um, Again, he is Christian and has a strong devotion to God, and it, his son's name is actually no coincidence um, with regard to his faith. He was diagnosed with disassociative identity disorder at age 40. He was born in Wrightsville, Georgia. He was uh, weakly and kind of chunky as a sixth grader. He suffered a lot of mental, emotional, and physical abuse as a child in school. Um, prior to the ninth grade, the client had a significant stutter. He was very much overweight, uh, poor, uh, lacked a lot of self-efficacy, very lonely and silent, lacked any friendships or interpersonal relationships outside of his immediate family. Um, he was very fearful of the dark and highly insecure um, and grew, uh, didn't know it at the time, but he really truly valued loyalty in those in those early years, he, he sought it significantly, but had a hard time either identifying it or, or receiving it. Cultural data, he's African-American, large and close traditional family, lived in small, a smaller town in rural Georgia, devoted to God and worshiped frequently. Family ate traditional Southern foods and drank lots of sweet tea. Mother, Christine, Father, Willis, they met when they were 16 years old. Both parents came from very large households. His father had six sisters and his mother had six siblings. Holiday, holiday occasions were very large and boisterous. He never knew his parental grandfather, but he was very close with his maternal grandfather. He had, had also two older brothers, two older sisters, a younger brother, and a younger sister. All relationships are in good standing and have always been strong. Um, he did suffer his loss of his younger brother um, in a train accident that was very devastating for him um, later in life uh, when he was playing football for Dallas. His mother was always sweet and supporting. Father was stern, but yet you knew he always cared. They were a loving family, although they never really showed a lot of outwardly love, but you knew it was there and um, they always felt he felt supported and nurtured. His parents were church going and fun loving. He had a supportive and caring family. He never knew a time when he felt any form of mental, emotional, or physical abuse in his home. His mother always taught his family that color was invisible. They did not have a lot of money, but they had what they needed. Family was close, but did not show a lot of outwardly emotion or say, I love you. It was pretty much implied. Uh, 
Uh, he went and graduated as a valedictorian from this high school in Riceville, Georgia. He was awarded by the Academy of Achievement awarded as an honor student, college degree from the University of Georgia. The client is highly intelligent, very, very well read, and is enthusiastic with regard to learning. He is highly functioning and determined to not let his disassociative identity disorder hinder him in life. He feels he, it is his Christian duty to share his experience with those as an example of hope and perseverance. He is sociable and has a devotion to family. His marriage life has become problematic at the end of his career due largely to his complete self-absorption. Um, and he rarely mentions his son in, the, in, in this book at all. Uh, he's maybe mentioned briefly at two different times, so you really do not know the relationship there. His physical functioning at a very young age is where he became very routine-oriented. Um, he does 2,500 sit-ups a day, 1,500 push-ups a day. Routine has consisted of the same repetitions 365 days a year for the past 28 years. Um, he's done a total at, at the point in time of the writing of the book, 17,500 sit-ups a week, or every weekly he does do, um, 910,000 a year, and 25 point, almost 5 million in his lifetime. So he's very, very fit, very routine oriented, and just, it means a, a significant portion to him, and it's really a, a manner in which he started to develop um, his alter egos or his alter identities at an early age when he started to take uh, his physical condition as a significant um, uh, turn for him and how he was going to approach um, being able to become somebody or something in school. And this was back in about the seventh or eighth grade when he started working out significantly along the railroad tracks in his hometown. And that was really the, the turn for him as to where he began to, to try and get away from a lot of the things and the presenting problems that were identified earlier as being weakly and stuttering and afraid at school and um, those types of things. Mental cognitive and perceptual functioning. He was diagnosed with disassociative identity disorder at age 40. He is highely functioning and motivated not to let his diagnosis define him. He has had positive experiences with the majority of his alternate identities. Um, he has manifested alternate identities which have helped him throughout his life. However, there have been some that have been very, very negative for him or very, um, very challenging. And one of those was his daredevil identity, which had led to some extremely impulsive behavior. Um, ma the majority of his major life decisions were based on coin flips. Uh, whether he went to Georgia or Georgia Tech when he came into deciding which college he was going to play for, or whether he was going to leave college after winning the Heisman Trophy after his junior year and go and enter into the USFL or stay in there at Georgia for his senior year. And um, his coin flips led for him to, to, he did end up playing for Georgia and he did end up leave, being uh, the first major name player to go and join the USFL, signing a $3.9 million, million contract. Um, he had a warrior alternate identity, which was prone to aggression and served him well in the NFL. Um, he goes on and on in the book to talk about the, the, that just the exhilaration that he got in just making sure he pounded uh, physically another human being more so than they could ever uh, inflict any type of um, physical harm to him, and he took pride in it. Uh, he regrets never enlisting in the military. He sees things predominantly in black and white, and a big, big thing in the, in the, throughout the book is his commitment to uh, loyalty and routine-oriented scenarios, which the, he felt that the military would have provided him. Um, he played Russian roulette countless times, primarily based in that daredevil um, identity as his career was winding down. He never did uh, drink alcohol or did drugs. It's, it's note that he, he wanted to clearly point out he was not suicidal. Um, however, it's kind of contradictory into the sense of the Russian roulette, but he felt that that was just that tempting of, of fate and that exhilaration. He did not want to die by any means or shape or form. He had suffered a lot of rage moments and had homicidal thoughts and some threats, but he, he never made any real true attempts. It was just a lot of de debate back and forth in his head. 
emotional functioning. He was truly always serious, but positive. And he was very forward looking at all times. Affect, typically sincere, confident, but concerned and uncertain about his diagnosis. He was very concerned at first about it and what to do with it. And he was diagnosed for a while before he came forward and actually wanted to share it and knew that it was something he should do. Um, he became more accepting of his diagnosis as it allowed him to better understand himself. Um, he always seemed to be very verbal and cooperative. And again, no, we will not let the uh, diagnosis. Uh, his speech components were always within normal ranges when the way that he was um, describing and very well written and articulate. Um, he did stutter as a child. Um, his psychomotor activity actually is extremely highly, highly above normal. Um, no pattern of alcohol usage or suicidal thoughts, but there certainly were tendencies. Spiritual and religious affiliations. He is Christian. He has a deep devotion to God and Jesus Christ. He went to church regularly throughout his life. He acknowledges God for all of his accomplishments. He's grateful for the sacrifices made by Jesus Christ. He lived uh, by the golden rule, believes in turning the other cheek. They made him stronger and smarter, especially on the football field. And he goes on to talk about how People would try and always taunt and tease and do whatever it took to get him to make that um, that extra gesture to draw a flag or to get him out of his game. But he was sturdy, steadfast and always sincerely and highly uh, focused on his on only one thing, and that was physically imposing himself on another man. Motivation, um, always driven for success. Client is motivated to share his what well, was just success on the football field and in everything he ever did. Uh, with regard to the book, he was motivated to share a story with regard to his diagnosis of dissociative identity disorder. He was highly motivated. He once spent a year taking tennis lessons to win on a fun show, Superstar Challenge, which actually was kind of funny because that was a show in the early 90s. And he went on it just basically for fun and got smoked playing uh, tennis. He spent that year taking tennis lessons to go back and get on that show again the following year and actually won that event, which just goes to that competitive nature. Sherelle, I know you probably got that sound effect down by now. For those of you who don't know, that is a sound effect from Sports Center. And um, for Herschel, uh, well, his strengths were certainly athletic. Um, he, I'm sure, enjoyed being on Sports Center quite a bit, and um, he certainly relished all of his accomplishments at Georgia and the USFL and the NFL. Um, he refused to let his diagnosis of disassociative identity disorder define him. Um, he has a strong faith in God. Uh, he's devoted uh, to his family, humble. In a lot of ways, it's, he was humble, but in a lot of ways, he wasn't humble. I mean, he was highly, um, he was passive aggressively, very arrogant, but he just did so in such a way that it was all internal. Um, and he was definitely willing to share with those who were willing to be helped. He was highly competitive. He had a tremendous will to win, and he um, earned several academic and athletic, um, had earned several athletic accomplishments and academic accomplishments. Challenges and barriers. He has episodes of disassociations, which have led to violent outbursts. Uh, impulsive nature and a desire to live on the edge at times. He always kept people at arm's length, letting very few people ever really get to know him or get close. He lacked a lot of trust. And he believed they always had an angle, that people always had an angle. He's currently an entrepreneur in several businesses and several businesses and has interest in several things. Retired football player and athlete. And um, money is typically not a a problem for him at this point. You see client in there. I had, had was taking a different um, direction with this earlier, and now I have uh, noticed that I missed you know, one or two of those in taking them out. Impressions and assessment of uh, summary. Client presented a highly functioning, confident, sincere African-American male. He has a strong faith in God. He has a strong family support and relies on his internal drive to motivate him on a daily basis. He has a strong need for order and sees things predominantly in black and white. He has relied on alternate identities in the past as coping mechanisms. He was highly self-absorbed and his, his family life revolved around his interests. 
some of what his profession some of that was professional in nature, but he was always looking at the next something to fill the void rather than letting someone get close, including his wife, who eventually left him as she grew apart from his evolving need for self-absorption. Self Here is an echo map, and you can see that the alternate identities were significant in his life and had a lot of stress in here as the, the red lines indicate uh, significant stress. Um, and when you have some time, you can kind of look through all of this with his uh, culture gram. And there's a lot of the things that I just dis discussed in the, the biosocial are all here broken down in these areas. Life cycle. He's in the middle adult uh, life cycle. Um, he's in reflection on his own life now, especially in breaking free, diagnosis of disassociative identity disorder. Central uh, propositions of lifespan theory as it relates to middle adulthood. Uh, most importantly here, developmental uh, development involves both gains and losses. In midlife, there is a tie in the relationship between gains and losses. And he had quite a few of those in his life. He had tremendous gains and was highly motivated and was highly successful, but he did lose his, his wife as a result of a lot of that. Um, he lost himself in a lot of those identities. He was very impulse driven. Um, and here with increasing age and adulthood, there's an overall reduction in resources that midlife adults must put a major effort into managing resources. And for him, in a lot of ways that really went to managing how to live his life and he had to he finally he met up with a doctor that did him really did a really good and thorough uh, work with him and working for him to acknowledge where he was at and accepting of his mental illness and to work forward and moving through that and even though challenges increase in biological resource decrease in midlife there's still the possibility for change and that's what he did he made a significant change Uh, continuing in midlife adults often find often reach out and become more involved in socially responsible activities and a lot of that was went into him uh, wanting to do the book and write this book to, the, to let other people know because it was literally a good seven year period between diagnosis and writing of the book the sense of social obligation is there <clears throat> involves moving beyond their narrow self-interest to consider the general interests of others in a sense of to carry out his sense of obligation. Um, disassociative identity disorder, um, it changed names. It used to be called uh, multiple personality disorder prior to 1994. And these are just some statistics based on those with some mental illness. For Herschel, there was a lot of self-talk, voices in his head telling him it would be all right. Voices soothed him in the fear of the dark. Voices told him he was not a bad kid or an idiot. Um, he used his identities as coping mechanisms for all the verbal and physical abuse. Um, he truly hid a lot of his abuse, his bloody t-shirts early on. All of this was really prior to eighth, and eighth or during anything prior to eighth grade. And after ninth grade, he started to make that physical transformation between eighth and ninth grade is when he started running along the, the railroad tracks and the rocks and all these things and just physically starting to work out and become just mentally and physically strong. Um, he dealt with everything internally. He created identities which would allow him to cope with any situation in which he felt uncomfortable. Um, he was diagnosed in 2002. He had several alter egos. Um, he re states that his alternate egos did far more good than harm. He had two bad ones, and that was primarily the warrior and the daredevil. Um, DID, disassociative identity disorder, was his coping me mechanism. He had passages of time or lost time. Um, DID can allow people to still be highly functioning or keep, keep them functioning. And the key is the creation of another identity to deal with traumatic experiences or painful events. Alternate identities were a team. Coach in general um, were aware of the al alternates and called on them in particular occasions. Uh, the counselor helped overcome the verbal abuse, the beatings, and isolation, uh, used self-talk to reassure him that things were going to be okay. 
uh, the Sentinel or Sentry guarded and never let anyone get close to him. Uh, Daredevil uh, was his need for speed and impulsive decision making and the Russian roulette and all the things that he had done. Um, Hero was aware of the counselor. This alter ego desired praise and validation. Success on the football field brought the attention that it craved. Uh, Warrior uh, regrets never becoming a U.S. Marine. Allowed him to be merciless on the football field, being highly aggressive and, and craving physical contact. Um, relish knowing he could dominate those he faced. He worked harder, longer, and stronger. Uh, judge, everything was black and white and right or wrong, no exceptions. Drove his desire to be in the military, along with the warrior and the guard dog. Instant aggression, following anything perceived as a challenge by another human being. Uh, challenges which developed the dissociative identity disorder for him. Uh, he was an African-American male and he was in the time of segregation and uh, in the 60s. So he was predominantly a, a white school. He was a poor child on the other side of the tracks. He was overweight, had a stutter, lacked self-confidence. Um, he was an introvert and a daydreamer. And um, he remembers seeing and witnessing a fake lynching by the Ku Klux Klan when he was six on a, a schoolmate in the woods. Um, a teacher in the fourth grade once told him, quote, poor Herschel, life is going to be tough on you. You ain't going to amount to much in this life, child. Maybe you will get yours on the other side. Okay. Traditional theories were conflict theory and social learning theory. And the strength-based theory was resiliency theory. In conflict, conflict theory, it focuses on conflict and coercion and the role of power in social relationships. This was truly significant for him. Um, Herschel's walk, uh, Herschel Walker's mother and father worked for a white landowner in 1960s rural Georgia. And there was a significant difference in classes while he was growing up in the rural Wrightsville, Georgia. Um, Parents isolated Herschel from race issues, but as he grew older, he became aware of racism and its bias, um, which were in conflict, you know, in between what his parents were trying to show that it doesn't make a difference, but in, in reality, it did make a difference. As he uh, became older, he realized and became well read. The following quote from Martin Luther King uh, Many white Americans of goodwill have never connected bigotry with economic exploita exploitation. They have developed prejudice, but tolerated or ignored economic injustice. Um, and that was from his Why We Cannot Wait speech, which was predominantly for, for Herschel. It was, uh, he thought, um, he was exceptionally smart and graduated valedictorian, but he was flown all over the country based on his ability to play football and not because of his academic exploits. Um, sports were a traditional outlet out of poverty disproportionately percentage-wise of black for black male compared to white impoverished males. Um, and again, he was valedictorian of his class, but would have been would not have been flown all over the country or offered a free ride for his academics. And these are some modern uh, conflict theory assumptions. In social learning theory, um, these are really important for him because a lot of what he did um, came and he learned from those around him and all of the people that had parts in his life from the time he was young all the way through. Um, Albert Bender attempted to understand people as conscious thinking beings who can have influence on their environments. He believed that people can process information to actively influence how the environment controls them. Observational learning occurs when people observe role models and learn new behaviors as a result of those observations. Very, very crucial for him. The learning process is considered cognitive because people must pay attention to the role models and process this information in their memory. And role models are critical in develop, development of personality because of the principles of observational learning. Social learning theory is an approach that combines learning principles with cognitive processes, plus the effects of observational learning to explain behavior. Most importantly, for Herschel Walker's Bandura's notion of self-efficacy, self or his ability to perform behaviors that lead to expected outcomes. In the past, 
he was not able to perform due to lack of self-confidence. When he had a strong belief in their ability to perform certain behaviors, his confidence was high. Um, for him, social learning theory individuals that were crucial. Um, his parents were hardworking and religious. They were tremendous role models. They were always supportive and nurturing, um, especially in, in, in a sea of calm or a sea of turmoil that he always experienced in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, where he was just basically, there was a story he had of, he would save his dimes and nickels just to get people on the playground. He would pay them, just he would pass up milk or lunch or, or whatnot to pay people to just talk to him because he had so little interaction with anybody um, at that age. Uh, Coach Jordan in high school was very instrumental on him, believed in him, and helped him obtain his dreams through encouragement and hard work. He gave him regiments, gave him a chance to play football, gave him all those types of things that he needed and craved, um, and made his, all his hard work pay off. Frank Ross was his roommate at the University of Georgia and became his big brother on the football team and really looked out for him in a time where he didn't really know Herschel Walker at all at that time, but uh, kept him away from a lot of the things that really, really have challenged his alters that would have made it very difficult for him. Um, he ended up being an, an all-SEC academic, all-American. Um, well, Frank wa was, but so did Herschel, also became an academic all-American while in college as well. Uh, Donald Trump became the owner of the US in the USFL, the New, Jer New Jersey Generals, and uh, Told her, this really kept Herschel Walker from leaving either um, leaving pro football to join the military because Donald Trump had sat down with him discussing how important it was to do what you're good at, you know, and you can have you can make up and, and find ways to support in uh, the military and whatnot in the future, but you know, based on uh, your your what you what you're good at is what you should do, and the, the time will come for all of these other type of um, endeavors that you'll go off on and, and be successful at. Other crucial pay players for him were Tom Landry, uh, who's the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys, Tex Schramm, who was president and general manager. They were just men of great inte integrity that he wanted to learn from. Uh, concept of resilience theory. Resilience theory explains the phenomenon of positive adaption despite various adverse life conditions and traumatic events. Herschel worked hard on and overcame the fatty, fatty teasing, the schoolyard beating, stuttering, and isolation through positive self-talk, strong role models who believed in him and hard work. Hard work, self-discipline, internal motivation, faith in God, and a, a fire for success drove his resiliency and led to his successes. Um, he describes a lot of tweener situations where he felt that he was between certain things and this is part i guess where he would felt he never would let people get close to him um challenged in high school between defending an african-american students versus a principal who was mimicking a student in a derogatory racial manner herschel was a student advocate who took race out this was a story that in the the, the african-american students at his school were very upset with him because um the principal made a mimicking gesture to an African-American student for doing something wrong. Um, Herschel didn't know what to do because siding with the African-Americans may impact his relationship within the school and his possibility with the, the principal and those types of things or alienate him from his African-American student body. Um, what he did, it was something his mother had taught him, which was he took um, race out of the situation and sided against the African-American student body because the student was in the wrong. And that race really, truly played no part in him being wrong, which was actually a very, very mediated, very well um, read and a very mature response for somebody way beyond his age at that time. He spent time between football and track, was never too close with the politics and, and favoritism in any of the sports that he did. He was so busy always moving forward that he never had time to really to get involved in any of the peripheral stuff. Um, his popularity on the Georgia Bulldogs, he had to be humble and, and understanding of his hero status. And he craved attention, but he also needed to be humble because he didn't want to offend those that were around him, his teammates, because his success was primarily predicated on a lot of their efforts, uh, especially in the USFL when he was awarded a $3.9 million contract, the highest at that time, and created a lot of jealousy and difficulty in the locker room because 15, 20 players combined didn't earn what he was making by himself. Um, <clears throat> and he was always running from the old Herschel Walker, the old scared Herschel Walker.
his resiliency strengths. He had strong family support. He had strong belief in God, strong belief in himself. Um, he was exceptionally disciplined, highly self-motivated, hungered for success academically, socially, and athletically. He refused to quit when dealt with challenges or setbacks. In fact, he relished them. Pretty much any comp anything that was put up in, as a challenge in front of him uh, just drove him to succeed and, and to keep forward, keep moving forward. Um, here are the list of the articles that were read for uh, or utilized in the presentation. Um, in this particular article, uh, some of the key aspects were to, uh, discusses the definition of resiliency as, it, as the ability of individuals to maintain relatively stable mental function throughout the course of a traumatic event develops key characteristics of uh, resiliency, examines demographic, environmental, biological, and resilience factors as they apply to individuals who suffer from traumatic, ex traumatic stresses, looks at um, successful coping skills which did not involve drugs or extensive therapy. Um, for Herschel, I mean, he certainly created the alternate personalities or the alternate identities to help him uh, deal and to, to be resilient through all of his trials and tribulations. And the Collins article uh, focus on uh, resiliency, focus on the need for positive reinforcement, hope, optimism, positive coping mechanisms, build clients up, build self-efficacy, which Herschel did a lot on his own ways, but in the end, um, in working with uh, the doctor that diagnosed him, who had, he had met at a track event some 15 years earlier, he really um, was able over the last six to seven years become very well understood of where he's at and become uh, productive. With the Osborne article looked at uh, article look, looked at lifespan theory and resilience theory. Links Erickson, Erickson's lifespan theory, identity diffusion, and identity confusion to reconcile aspects of adversity. Um, focused on identity crisis. Discuss developmental focus on adversity discusses predictive explanatory constructs with relation to healthy development and in faces a face of adversity provides hope and optimism by using strengths of individual strengths of the individual individual so for Herschel in a lot of ways he just was able to <clears throat> grow from his experiences and when he was able to look at himself and how he had gotten to where he was after diagnosis he was able to use a lot of his strengths and all of his strengths to become a better man Um, Richardson's article defines resiliency as the process of coping with adversity, change, opportunity in a manner that results in the identification, fortification, or enrichment of resilient qualities, protective factors. Um, Herschel's case de developed identities which coped with all of the areas that he was challenged with in his life. The sentry guard dog for protection, the warrior and hero dealt with his aggression and his desire for physical dominance and reward, and the judge, his perception of things only being in black and white. Um, in the rudder, four ways with overcoming the odds when dealing with adversity, um, reduce the impact. Herschel dealt with the alternate identities, reduce the negative chain reaction of risk. He continued to believe in himself regardless of obstacles, promoting resilient traits, traits, strong faith, hard work, setting up new opportunities for success, always kept looking forward and was grateful things, things, um, that things that worked out the way they did, he has no regrets. Um, some bio, social, spiritual achievements for himself. He had some strong, he had strong faith and devotion to God. Believes God has always had a heart, hand in guiding him. Believes God has put people in his life at the right times to lead him in the right direction. Grateful for Jesus that he had died for us. Um, is extremely humble. Um, is now as a man he is humble based on his understanding of where he was he felt always that he was humble before but did not realize how selfish he was in all of his his aspects and decision making because pretty much his whole life and his wife followed him around based on his desire to to be successful in whatever he put himself into whether it was track and field whether it was football in any regard of a number of different cities or the fact that he wanted to, to join uh, the Olympic bobsled team and 
go through into the Winter Olympics and spend all that time training and conditioning to all the way taking tennis lessons for a year in order to be competitive in the Superstar Challenge. Um, and he had several significant accomplishments. In a history of accomplishments, he's 1980 um, valedictorian graduating class. Um, he was also a 1980 Academy of Achievement Honor Roll Award, high school state championships in football and track, NCAA freshman rushing record at the University of Georgia. He has 10 NCAA records, 15 SEC records, 30 University of Georgia records. Um, he's in the College Football Hall of Fame, 15 years in the USFL and NFL. He has 8,225 yards and 61 touchdowns, uh, 512 pass receptions, 21 touchdowns, and he was in the 1990 Olympic bobsled team. Um, cultural diversity and oppression assessment, racial injustice in the South in the 60s is when he grew up. Uh, he was from a poor family. Parents worked for a white landowner. He picked up, uh, picked on as a child, was integrated into his school with only 25 African-American students. Um, he had fears of the Ku Klux Klan and he had witnessed a fake lynching when he was younger. Um, his resiliency strengths, he had strong family support, strong belief in God, strong belief in himself, exceptionally disciplined, self-motivated, hungered for success academically, socially, and athletically, and refused to quit when dealt challenges or setbacks. Ethical dilemmas, um, which could develop as a result of working with a person with disassociative identity disorder. Um, if they com uh, commit or threaten violent acts, those things that definitely would need uh, reported. Uh, working with people who change identities, you need to make sure you're always in areas that are safe and know your um, access to, to doors and you know any obstructions in between where you're going to be um, and how to get out. Um, things that someone may do, they lose time and uh, don't recall, uh, could create some challenges in reporting. Um, differences between the strength-based approach and traditional approaches. Strength-based really uh, focused on reliance upon self, faith-based, internal motivation, positive self-talk, um, and for Herschel's case, being highly devoted to himself and to success, routine, highly routine-oriented, committed, and patient. Professional development and applying these theories. For myself, learned how real life circumstances applying practical applications of theory. No one theory is a perfect fit. Um, understanding theory is helpful in assessing a client's needs and providing appropriate help recommendations. Uh, the, proper, the project was useful in ascertaining critical thinking skills and assessments. Understand when a theory is a not a good fit for the client to be able to be adaptable, to also to be able to be adaptable and also try something new. myself, um, strengths and growth areas as a result of this presentation. Um, first of all, I started getting very nervous at the beginning to the point of feeling fairly comfortable towards the end. Um, uh, good practical usage on theory application. Had to definitely work on some time management and organizational skills. Uh, appreciation for hard work, especially reading that book. I mean, the guy was phenomenal in what he did and accomplished and where he's at. And uh, it's just, uh, it was, it, it was, a joy to see that somebody can work that hard. It's an inspiration to, for me to try and get up and do some of the things that I need to get doing in my life. If, if he can do the number of sit-ups and push-ups and everything before 6 a.m. Um, tremendous humbleness. Um, uh, I've definitely been humbled by a lot of the things I've read and understand and, and the things that I need to do and place a greater faith. Um, and not only myself, but in, in God and know that things will work out. Um, provide courage for work and appreciation for resiliency and overcoming adversity. And I think that concludes everything. I really 
truly appreciate your time. I hope that you learned something from this other than all my stuttering and stammering and my four or five typos that I've seen as I went through this. Um, I hope you have a good rest of your day or evening and uh, thanks again for watching.